Hi everyone, this is Jay from Interview Query and the Data Science Jay YouTube channel. Today I am here with Sandeep. He is a PhD student at the University of Minnesota and he's doing his PhD in decision science and information. Welcome Sandeep. And today I'd love to talk to you kind of first about your background, but also just a little bit more about multi-armed bandits, A-B testing, and some of the stuff that you're studying right now in your PhD. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'm really excited to talk to you. And also as usual, any PhD student, they're very excited to talk about their research. So yes. <laughs> I'm really happy you gave me an avenue to do that and tell more, more people about the data sciences department and also the area that, of research I'm working on. Thank you. My undergrad and master's was in India in aerospace engineering. But uh, unfortunately, even after all those studies, like there were not many jobs in India in that field. So the second best thing I was good at was math and uh, data science was a very quickly growing field back then. So I gave interviews for some companies who were doing analytics and I really liked it. And eventually I got a job at Google as a data scientist. So in their uh, Google search anti-abuse team. So my job there was to make sure that there are no spammy websites that come up in Google search results. So that's where, you know, like I got introduced to all the SQL technologies, all the Google internet technologies about data, big tables, everything. And eventually I got into uh, machine learning in order to like create these features that are indicative of spam and create these models that can automatically filter spam. I was really enjoying my work there because I get to work on highly impactful uh, products, learn all these techniques and tools. But I still saw that I was hitting my skill ceiling because I was not trained in these sciences. And I saw that there is a lot to learn here and I can do much more impactful work by having like a higher education. Eventually, I stumbled upon the information and data sciences department it is not really like a typical computer science program. So that's where I think people are not really clear about uh, like decision sciences. So decision sciences is akin to causal inference. So you get trained on or you learn how to attribute cause to an effect. So A-B testing is like a uh, classic causal inference, right? So you test the difference between like a control group and a treatment. And then whatever is the difference, you attribute it to the treatment because everything else is random. But unfortunately, in the real world, that's not the case. So you cannot conduct experiments on everything. Yeah, so let's say you want to understand if email is good or bad, you can tell half your employees to not use email and half your employees to use email and see how they perform. So it's very hard. Uh, same thing in case of like public policies, you know, like you want to test out a new policy and you can tell half the people that, let's say they can take a job training program and half the people, you know, they can take a job training program. So there is a lot of uh, observational data that comes. Theory in decision sciences tells, you know, like what are the methods that you can use in order to kind of mimic a treatment from this observational data. So these days, I think uh, there is a growing demand for uh, people who understand causal inference methods from observational data in uh, big tech companies as well, because they start to realize, uh, you know, not everything can be tested, not everything can be uh, done in an experiment. You still need to make really critical decisions and observational methods are uh, you know, like deriving cause and effect from observational data is one way to do it. So the recent uh, Nobel Prize in uh, economics was uh, awarded to Guido Imbens and uh, Joshua Angrist, who pioneered the methods of uh, obtaining uh, cause and effect from observational data. So I think uh, everyone is starting to realize the uh, impact that these methods have. Uh, so they are a great counterpart to conducting uh, A-B testing and experiments. That is my field. So that is what decision sciences more or less are about. Yeah. And my research is in, uh, you know, like A-B testing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I still do a lot of observational data and causal inference. At the same time, my uh, research is in, uh, so the better ways uh, or better statistical methods that can be used to conduct A-B testing methods and, you know, like multi arm bandits and stuff. Yeah. Gotcha. So I guess within um, A-B testing and causal inference too, the way I've learned it, you know, being in tech uh, and industry was always the fact that, you know, if you can't A-B testing, then causal inference is like the second best thing you can do, right? Mm -hmm. Is that still true? Or do you think it's like more equivalent? Like you would rather do use causal inference first versus like doing an A-B test. Like, is there any kind of priority or does it depend on the situation? So definitely, like if I have infinite resources, I would 
A-B test everything because that is the cleanest way uh, to get uh, the effect of something on uh, the outcome. All the other causal inference methods are trying to get as close to that as possible. Again, uh, so it's not just that you cannot experiment some things and that's why you use uh, causal inference. Sometimes, uh, so there is not enough time to roll the product. So then you just want to see observational data and then see whether there is an effect. Sometimes you don't have an infrastructure to test. Sometimes you don't have enough users uh, to test. So mm -hmm. all these are the other reasons uh, where you would uh, bank on observational data and causal inference. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with that too, because um, even at interview query, you know, like we try to run experiments sometimes, but many times uh, I just can't bring myself to build the infrastructure for it and kind of manage the overhead. And so a lot of the times we just kind of look at causal inference and we're like, okay, you know, these people converted because, you know, 20% more of them, you know, clicked mm -hmm. on this feature, you know, versus, yeah. you know, the others did not. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of times even, um, I think a lot of that kind of comes down to data quality is, is even bad for a lot of that causal inference to begin with as well. And I think, you know, personally, I haven't had the foresight to have that uh, infrastructure in place. And mm -hmm. so I guess jumping on to the next topic, you know, besides yeah. me ranting about the infrastructure problems at the business that I'm running, uh, I'd love to know, you know, like you talked a little bit about multi-arm bandits. Mm -hmm. uh, what are multi-arm bandits and kind of like, how do they relate to A-B testing? So multi-arm bandits, uh, so it's interesting because, so the name comes from uh, uh, one-arm bandits that are in like casinos. So where mm -hmm. you pull the arm and then you get uh, to see the reward. Mm -hmm. uh, so the entire field came from that sort of motivation where, you know, there is a gambler and let's say I have like $20 and every time I want to use this machine, I need to give in $1. So the question would be like, and let's say I have like three, four different machines to choose from. And all these machines have different reward rates. What is the best way I use my $20 to maximize my reward? Uh, mm -hmm. How will I quickly learn which machine gives the most reward? Uh, so that's the motivation from, uh, you know, like understanding this multi-arm bandit method. So the algorithms in multi-arm bandits will tell you how to play this game. Gotcha. You know, like how, how to go uh, pull the arm of a, um, casino machine and then see the reward and should you you know keep pulling that arm or should you go change you know should you explore different uh, machines or should you exploit the one that is giving you good rewards so far so how is it similar to ab testing in a way in ab testing you are trying to do the same so you are trying to find a variant that is best you know that mm -hmm. gives you the most uh, utility um, so so that's how they are related but uh, the main difference i would say is uh, like randomization uh, so the central or the core concept in A-B testing is randomization. But in the case of multi-arm bandits, so you observe the reward or you observe the outcome and then change your decision based on that outcome, which you don't do it in A-B testing. So that's the main difference. Gotcha. So to me, it seems like a lot of multi-arm bandits is when you have limited resources, mm -hmm. right? Like you only have $20, you need to figure mm -hmm. out which one is the best reward before you run mm -hmm. out of the money, right? Versus an A-B testing, you'd have mm -hmm. infinite money and you just keep on testing it until you found like the right slot machine. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say that. One other key difference is, uh, so the way you allocate uh, resources in uh, multi-arm bandits, so the entire motivation is to get to where you can exploit as much as possible. So you don't care, really care about the others. So all you know is this one has a better shot at giving me maximum reward. Uh, but in the case of A-B testing, the main use there is to perform like statistical inference to understand with a certain statistical significance, whether it is one, I mean, treatment is better than a control or not. Uh, so in A-B testing, you do not look at the outcome before you finish the experiment. So that's like rule number one mm -hmm. of A-B testing, you know, do not peek at the values until you finish uh, the experiment. Gotcha. Yeah. So then is it the case where a multi arm bandit isn't like based on fundamental statistics then at that point, because you are like, you know, peaking and then re-optimizing for like the better one at the end. I guess, why do people use it then if it's like not fundamentally, you can't really detect, you know, a change or not, or you, you make changes like incrementally, like, is that okay? I guess within the rules of like science and data science. 
Yeah, so uh, so let me give you an uh, like a real world use case of uh, where multi amp bandits are used. So Yahoo used to use this a lot. I'm sure they're using it even now. But uh, so one of the case studies that I read was Yahoo using it to uh, decide on what headlines of the news article should be. Uh, so they would test five to six uh, headlines and they would run multi amp bandit on top. Uh, so they would do this for all the articles that they're publishing on their homepage. So Essentially, what they're doing there is they're trying to optimize the, you know, click through rate or, you know, uh, so whatever their metric of optimization is for. So they don't really care about how better is the best performing variant is compared to others. All they care about is, you know, am I allocating most of my users to the best performing one? And they do this for hundreds of articles. So they don't really care about how for each article, how each and every variant perform statistically compared to the other one. So they care more about uh, utility than uh, statistical significance or inference. So I would say in the large scale, so when you're conducting tons and tons of experiments and you don't really care about inference and you care about utility more, then uh, people would tend to go with multi arm bandits. Uh, otherwise, A-B testing. I um, mean, for example, uh, in your case, you might want to see that payment funnel uh, perform compared to others. How should my checkout page look like? So there you definitely care about how your other versions perform because you're trying to learn how your users are behaving and you're trying to learn different design elements that are working or not working. And you will use that knowledge to create subsequent uh, design decisions or subsequent experiments. So their inference is really important for you. Even knowing what failed and why it failed is important for you apart from knowing what succeeded. But in the case of these news articles, they are publishing thousands of articles every day doesn't really matter to get inference for every variant. Gotcha. Okay. So it sounds like, yeah, you want to maximize utility. So it's like you design a process or a system mm -hmm. that will maximize that utility without really thinking about any sort of uh, incremental learnings uh, from the entire process itself. And so I can see <laughs> scenarios where that, if I relate it back to interview query again, you know, for example, mm -hmm. we give out a lot of questions to our readers. We like send out like questions in like an email newsletter. Mm -hmm. To me, a lot of the times I'm always wondering like which questions should perform the best, like which ones are people yeah. actually clicking on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, we have a goal where we wanna get more comments yeah. on all of our questions. And mm -hmm. so it's not really the fact where like, if we optimize every single question, right? And it, it turned out that like everyone wanted a really easy SQL question and that maximized click through rate, but mm -hmm. that would kind of ruin our product at the same time, right? Because then it'd be yeah. like, okay, now we don't have diversity of any other questions here. So I think like it's pretty easy to like optimize too far potentially mm -hmm. in these scenarios where you're just going yeah. in one direction and then you kind of mm -hmm. ruin all the other metrics. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, you're correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I could see with Yahoo, you know, I mean, maybe they just become like the clickbait kind of like scene business. And then over the long term, you know, no mm -hmm. one actually sticks around with them because this multi-armed mm -hmm. bandit is like optimizing for this weird short term, like, you know, dopamine yeah. thing. So um, yeah. that's a great example, actually. I guess like, do you, what's the future for A-B testing, causal inference and multi-armed bandits? Since, you know, you're doing this PhD, I'm sure mm -hmm. you're looking into like, trying to figure out, you know, new kind of like frontiers for this. And I guess, yeah. you know, what do you, do you have an example of kind of like, you know, what is something that's kind of on the forefront of everyone's mind for like decision science in the space? Yeah, for sure. So there are a lot of areas where uh, the boundaries are being pushed and, you know, uh, giving something like uh, Nobel prize to this field definitely puts a spotlight on these and, you know, more and more people uh, would want to understand what this is and use it in their fields. So one example that I saw recently, which I was very impressed was uh, by this company called unlearn.ai, created digital twin for clinical trials. So from what I understand, they're already uh, starting to use it in real drug clinical trials. Again, so there, one of the biggest problems in clinical trials is, right? So it's ethical issue where you can't randomly put people into, you know, giving a treatment or placebo. I mean, that's the only way to, unfortunately, to infer the effectiveness of a drug. But one way that this company is trying to do is, so create like a digital twin for someone who is getting a treatment rather than having like a random other person in a control group. 
So mm. they would use all the previous data that they have in similar trials and then create a profile of a digital person who is in either like treatment or a placebo and then predict how they would perform if they are put in a control group or if they are put in a treatment group. So that is a very great uh, way that they're doing. So they use methods like matching that is very popular in causal inference. Some of the methods that the uh, recent Nobel laureates developed were in matching methods. So the best way to create matching and the best way to use them. So that is one area where I see, you know, like um, it's insane because now more and more uh, drugs can be tested and they need less and less participants in the trials. And the uh, iteration time that it takes to change the drug and develop new will be much faster. So drugs for more diseases can now be developed. So that's really great. So that's one example that I can think of. Wait, wait, how would you give drugs to a digital twin though? Are you just forecasting like some weird genome sequencing thing? I know nothing about biotech, so this is like, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. Basically you are predicting how they would have performed if they were put in uh, placebo or if they were given treatment. So what you would do is, so you would see all the treat, uh, like covariates or the features of the person who is in treatment, let's say like, what their age is, what their gender, or, you know, like health status, like you collect all this information. So you also see like how similar people performed in placebos in different uh, diseases. So there is some amount of like transfer learning that can happen between, you know, like different uh, diseases or drugs. So you use all these data in order to aid in your prediction or, you know, reduce your variance. So you need less and less sample size. So it is definitely a start. There is a reason that it didn't happen till now. Uh, so that's why I would say these are like really, really cutting edge. And of course, there are some problems with it. It is not perfect, but where the companies or the drug companies can use it, they will use it. Gotcha, okay. And <laughs> how can you, I guess, trust this, uh, I guess, predictive model, you know, given that as a person who has made predictive models in the past, I understand how bad they can be, especially when you don't have like the full data mm -hmm. set and you know predictions yeah. and you know i'm sure if they've never given this drug to someone before then how would they know how to model mm -hmm. that experience in the future do you have any ideas on how that's supposed mm -hmm. to be like a concern or not for mm -hmm. uh, this company i don't know exactly how they're uh, are using this for validation but i am i don't even think there is like uh, clear FDA guidelines. So I'm sure they might be working with FDA in order to you know, like test these methods with them and understand these methods with them. So that part, yes, definitely we should be skeptical of uh, these things. And again, so that's why they are at the cutting edge of uh, doing these things. And these are not really like prominent or you know widely used. They are still under test and they're still under development. And this is still a startup, which is like two, three years old. They just rolled out for uh, like, you know, very like probably like, you know, not so difficult use case at the start and then they will eventually do it for others. Cool, gotcha, okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome, so Sandeep, thanks for your time here today. Uh, is mm -hmm. there any kind of closing thoughts or places where people can reach you uh, that you have on like the subject matter? So my website, most of the work I do is there and most of the links to my socials or where they can reach me is there. And I generally encourage people to talk to me about the field or, you know, like working at Google or data science. So I even have uh, like a Calendly link in my website. So where anyone can schedule like a 30 minute call uh, to just talk to me about uh, everything in general. So uh, please reach out to me if you want to talk about this more. All right, nice. Yeah, that's a dangerous Calendly link where anyone can <laughs> schedule. I think uh, I've, I've experimented with that before too, but <laughs> got old real fast. Uh, thanks, Sandeep. <laughs> We'll see you around soon. Yeah, thank you so much.